And now we're going to be back here in the room. Lucas Cullen. Lucas Cullen has been developing software commercially for over 15 years. Don't look that old. Both over here and in the UK. He's currently studying mass at QUT and runs the Bitcoin meetup in Brisbane along with a small Bitcoin consultancy. What's the name of the consultancy, Lucas? I'm sorry. Um, and you write software for Bitcoin startups, so um, we're going to invite Lucas up to the podium. Do you want to do that? That's a, I, need, I need to sit at this yeah, point. All right. Sure. Have, have a mic. We'll both have mics. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So you're actually one of the uh, one of the folks who, as I said in my um, opening talk, is vibrating with excitement because of the promise of blockchain technology, right? Yeah, that, that's right, Mark. So what, what do you do with it? Okay, so. Um, Elizabeth touched on quite a lot of applications um, that blockchain technology can do, um, but I've written about uh, I've written a, a couple of blogs on a few of them, a, a few good concrete examples that might um, uh, resonate with the audience. So, um, a couple of months ago, I received an email from um, British Airways saying my frequent flyer points were about to expire. I used to live in the UK and, and develop software over there. So what British Airways and a lot of the uh, airlines do is they generate proprietary tokens. And as Elizabeth mentioned, they're just tokens. They're just the number that, ex that exists on a server somewhere that says this account number has this many frequent flyer points. And that is protected um, and backed up, etc. Mm. You but hope. The, <laughs> you hope. Now, the problem that has is these frequent flyer points, they're only 6,000. Um, I don't even know what 6,000 British Airways miles are worth. But there's somewhere out there um, that would want those, those points. So because I've acquired them and because I've spent money acquiring them, they should be my asset and I should be able to distribute them or sell them back to whoever I, I, I choose. So by using a blockchain technology, we can now create an open market for, for something like a, a frequent flyer mile. Um, and so you're taking something that's not very liquid and making it fundamentally liquid using the blockchain. Exactly. Because it's secured by math and beca um, by the blockchain, then it doesn't matter who receives or, or gets these tokens, that we should be able to swap them and trade them and, and, fill, and, and fill those uh, seats on the plane to do it. And if we take that uh, example a little bit further, when I, when I flew down to Melbourne to meet the Cointree guys, I showed up to the counter. Um, now, now what is Cointree? Uh, Cointree is a Melbourne-based exchange uh, down okay. at down in Melbourne. So right. went down there to meet those guys. Now, when I turned up to my uh, uh, to, to the to check in, the um, the steward asked, uh, the, the the clerk asked, "Do I have any proof of identity?" Um, and I actually just showed her the printed out. Um, uh, receipt of my flight and they took that as security to get onto the plane. Another way to do that would just to be to issue that seat as a token. Now wh when I turn up to the uh, airline I can then present that token back to the company and use that as my boarding pass. And by the same token, if, if I was to miss that flight, that flight is effectively null and void. But as a consumer, I should be then able to trade that with someone who wants to get on that flight. And if it's $10, I get $10 more than, than, than I would have before. And because, like I said, because it's backed by math and security of the blockchain, there is no risk to the airlines. There's no risk to the airlines around, financially, around fraud. Around fraud, that's right. You can't, you can't double spend or double create that token to get onto that, that seat on that airline. Right. The same uh, identification procedures should have applied. They should have checked my driver's license, etc., but they didn't. So, again, there's no yeah. risk to, from a security point because it doesn't matter about your boarding pass or ticket. There's still checkpoints to get onto the aircraft. Right. Okay, so, so, so we could see then a whole bunch of things that we don't think of as being liquid frequent flyer points being one of them, becoming liquid because we simply start to use, the we, we basically attach them or put them in the blockchain, right? That, that, that's correct, yes. So, so uh, are you starting to see, are, are businesses starting to come to you to go, could you do this for us? Can you create these markets for us? Oh, oh definitely. I've been approached by a few um, uh, 
large, large companies to start looking at ways to implement this. And with coloured coins and counterparty, the technology exists now to do it. It takes you about 30 minutes to set up a token. Virgin Airlines could have set up a counterparty token in, in half an hour and be done. It's, it's that quick. 30 minutes. That's right. Because you have all of the tools and they're off the shelf and you can just sort of go out there and do it. That's right. There's, there's providers that are coming out. There's people who are entering this market to provide um, these services and make these, these technologies easier to um, implement. So we're, are we about to see sort of a whole bunch of, I guess, white label blockchain applications now? I, I think so. But I mean, to touch on someone else's point before about what... What is the incentive or the motivation to secure the network? If Virgin would just create their own token, then they need nodes to um, protect and, and to secure that. So with a, a technology like Coloured Coin or Counterparty, that information is actually stored into the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain in the op return code um, field. So it's protected by the Bitcoin uh, nodes and infrastructure. And, the, you know, and then the miners get their financial reward by mining coins. So we also, Elizabeth also touched on pegging side chains. So that's basically the same thing. So the, the, main, the main chain is maybe Bitcoin using something like the op return code to persist data and then other chains pegged to that. So, so basically Bitcoin, the, the Bitcoin blockchain becomes the, the main tap root, but there's a whole bunch of other routes that are, that are coming off of it that are using the strength of that tap root for their own purposes. That's right. That's what we're seeing at the moment. So, so, and this goes back to a question that I then got asked, you know, is it going to be the Bitcoin, Bitcoin blockchain or is it going to be the others? And the answer is probably both, right? That the answer is that there's enough reason to create separate blockchains, but there's also a lot of really good reasons to stay connected to the main Bitcoin blockchain. That's right. And I guess the main reason at the moment is the financial reward, that Bitcoin has the highest value. Mm -hmm. If another coin uh, outgrew that value, I'm sure that would be, um, yeah, that would be the, the, the choice. All right. So how did you end up doing this? How did you end up getting into all of this and start becoming a Bitcoin programmer? Was that hard? I mean, how did you find out about it? Um, it, was, it was actually funny, again, um, be, I came back from the UK uh, in about 2008 and I got back to uh, country old Queensland and we didn't have uh, RFID, we still had paper tickets to get onto the train. Um, so I said to one of uh, the engineers, I said, well, what's the problem, why can't we do electronic cash, uh, or why can't we do these you know, tokens that, that, that allow us onto services? And he basically said, um, it, it's double spend and look up uh, Bruce Schneider's book, um, he's, he wrote about double spend for 10 years ago. So I got onto that. I had to read, and this was just before um, Bitcoin came around, 2008, like I said. Um, I then started working at Bank of Queensland, and um, so again, we started talking around electronic cash and, and money, and I just uh, happened to Google and, and see what, what the um, advances had been, and Bitcoin come along, and uh, as a software developer, and uh, I guess a, a bit of a math background, you start to scrutinize um, the code. You, try, you, you start to ask all these questions, if it's not backed, if it's not this, if it's not that, um, and it really highlight, highlights your um, uh, misunderstanding of money. Um, and when you start to get to... Uh, all what, the, do you, what do you mean by misunderstanding of money? Where, you don't get taught at school where money comes from. Um, oh, you mean that there's a reserve no, bank and a reserve bank... Exactly. Prints, exactly. Okay. And, you, and you, you might get told it's backed by gold, etc. You get all these... But as an, older, as an adult, you start to question these things and you start to look. And when, when you come out of... Uh, when you get to the end of the line and there are no more um, things that Bitcoin can't stand up to, no more scrutiny, you start to think, well, hey, maybe this is it. Uh, so then that's kind of when you, you flip and say, well, you run out of wires and start embracing what it can do. Okay, so, I mean, so that explains sort of how you came, I guess, to, to Bitcoin. How did you end up forming a consultancy around it? Um, well, I just started looking around for um, uh, members uh, or, or people that knew about Bitcoin in Brisbane. Right. Um, there was no Bitcoin Brisbane meetup, so I just started one. Um, and how many people do you have coming to that uh, now? We've got about, there's 190 in the book and I see about half a dozen here today. Right. There's 100 and how many members now? 190. Okay, on, that's very good, yeah. yeah. So I just started um, yeah, st started the group. Um, yeah, it's free to come. We just try and talk about it and um, yeah, maybe run a topic on, on the night and mm -hmm. educate people. Um, and then from that, I 
started getting a lot of questions um, about can you do this, can you do that, so I said sure, and um, yeah, started a consultancy around it. So it was doing the right thing that actually then led to you starting a business. Yeah, that's you know, right. Starting, starting the meetup. Do you, do you find, I mean, you, do you find just regular members of the public coming in because they're interested in what this Bitcoin thing is and they don't know too much about it? Yeah, so we see a, a bit of a mixed bag. Um, you see people speculating, which is fine. You see early adopters. Nice. You see people from the software. Um, you see people just come in, ask some questions. Just um, typically is like, what wallet to choose? Um, so some real fundamental questions. So we just try and um, show the pros and cons of all the wallets, um, get them on board, present some services like Cointree, Coinjar, etc. Nice. Um, and just help them yeah, on their way and hopefully a meeting point that they come, can come back to if they do have questions and you know, it, it may not, I might not have the answer but probably someone in the group does have that answer and right. we can all help each other and, and grow the community. I mean, is this when you, when you have a problem in your own work that you're trying to solve, where do, you, where do you go? Do you go out to the internet? Do you go out to your local community? You know, because some of these problems will be cryptographic problems which are very difficult, right? So... Yeah. Um, well, I disagree. The, the, the crypto problems have been in the public domain for quite a while. So they're actually, like you mentioned at the start of your talk, um, it's just the, the paper that brought them all together. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of literature on them and there are a lot of libraries in whatever programming language you want to, um, uh, to implement those. And most of them are dermatistic as well. So given a set number of inputs will always yield one right. um, distinct output. So it's very easy to test from a software point. Um, but the forum is getting quite good. There are a lot of members on there who will give up their time to help you uh, with questions. But at the end of the day, it is just software. And those, um, like I said, those libraries have been around for a while. So do you, so it, as time's been passing, certainly over the last couple of years, it's been easier and easier for you to be able to put together something for a client because there's more libraries around. Do you expect then, that we're, are we going to see um, the, a sort of boutique consultancy like you maybe uh, run out of business by someone on Freelancer in Pakistan who's creating next week's blockchain? I mean, if I went on Freelancer right now and typed in blockchain, would I come up with 100 hits in Pakistan or in Uzbekistan with people who could do this? Yeah, I guess that's a threat from a lot of industries. Yeah. Um, being in software development for the last 15 years, you, you, you're seeing that. And sometimes you do outsource it to other countries. Um, yeah, and even now... Well, then where's the next place in the value chain for you? I mean, if doing the basic block level blockchain technology is now all in the libraries, you know, where, where do you think you're going to need to be as a business? What's the moving target for you on that? Well, I, I think the education and... Um, I guess explaining to people the benefits or businesses the benefits and having that, um, I mean, like I said, the, the literature is all out there on the internet and people can go on and read it and scrutinize it, but um, a lot of people don't have time or, or, or et cetera to... But they also don't have your technical background. They don't necessarily have a background in maths and I think that's it's probably also something that would, when people hear cryptography, a lot of the time they get quite confronted by the mathematics behind it. That's right too. So I guess they do have questions and they can go to the internet, but if they have that, uh, I guess, someone they can ask for. I mean, it's probably the same for a lot of industries. You could probably go off and do your own tax return, but people just don't want to. They just, you know, it's, yeah. it's a cost that they don't want to incur via their own personal investment. Um, so they, again, it's just a service. So people will stick to what they're good at and just outsource um, what they're not good at. Stick, stick to the business. If that's, you know, flying planes like Virgin, then stick to that and then, you know, outsource the rest. Do you suspect that in um, 10 years, your little consultancy will be a big consultancy and you'll have the big end of town coming to do a lot of work? Or do you think it's just going to be sort of something that comes and goes? Um, I hope it grows, but we'll, we'll, I guess we'll see. Um, there might be some other parties that come in with more resources that can, you know, that from a resource point, they can, uh, they can beat us. Um, but I guess we do have a leg up that we've been in the space for a while. Um, mm. So we've got some... Uh, intimate knowledge. I mean, I've made some mistakes. I've sent transactions with like four Bitcoin miners fee. So yeah, expensive mistakes. Um, but you learn from your mistakes. Um, like math and Bitcoin, it, it, it's not a spectator sport. You, you only learn by doing it. So uh, yeah, unless you unless you pull the trigger on a Bitcoin transaction, doesn't ma you know, matter how much you uh, read about it. Right. There has to be a point where you send it and you you check that address and then you send it and you pray that it gets there. <laughs> On that note, let's all thank Lucas Cullen.